Hi, everybody. Welcome to Optimal Health Redefined. I'm Dr. Diane Ginsberg. I'm Sheila. And we are in the kitchen today. So <laughs> we got a little change of venue, might make it a little bit more exciting because we're going to do a, a bit of our wrap up and a summary, if you would, of what we found continuous glucose monitor. Last week, I combined a little bit of hormone changes with what we saw in the glucose changes of me as a menopausal woman and, and things maybe that you can expect along the way. So we thought today, since Sheila is premenopausal in her 40s and we have, we have that to kind of compare to where I was, we could wrap up a lot of things that A, she saw and also we've had a lot of patients get involved, which is really cool. Say, hey, I wanna see what I look like so now we've got a bigger database to say what we've seen in different people. So we're going to talk a little bit today about things that affect some more than others. And then always remember the take home. And I can tell you that from my own experiences is that there are days when X, Y, Z happens. So food will affect you more versus days that might be a little more relaxed. It may affect you a little bit less. So, so always remember our body is a pretty complicated roller coaster that we're doing the best we can to balance. Yeah, and I, the, the coolest thing for me has been the individualization that I've seen across the patients that I've worked with and then across myself. So just kind of what my main takeaway was, and I think this kind of help you with um, actually maybe your teenager, your teenage girl that um, is struggling a little bit. So my biggest takeaway was that I do not handle starchy carbs well. I said that last time, really sends my blood sugar up. I, I saw an elevation with gluten-free pasta. Uh, with potatoes and with rice. Um, brown rice didn't elevate it as much as white rice did, which was like through the roof. Um, Gluten-free pasta was pretty similar to white rice for me. Uh, potatoes was actually not bad. And I didn't really see a big difference between sweet potatoes and white potatoes for me. Um, I did eat French fries one day. We went out to lunch after church and I did see a pretty big elevation with French fries when they were white potato French fries. Um, which I was actually surprised because I had like a cheeseburger bowl. So it was basically just a cheeseburger with lettuce, like no bread or anything. But then I did have like a small amount of French fries on the side. Um, and I did see a pretty big elevation after that. And so I have realized that, you know, a paleo type diet is probably best for me because if, on days that I ate just meat and vegetables type meals um, and even with fruit, my blood sugar stayed, you know, maybe went up to 110, 120 post meal came back down to 100 or 90. And it just did gentle rolls throughout the day. And I felt fine. I never, even on days I do CrossFit, which is a pretty high intensity workout. I didn't, I never felt like on those days that I didn't have enough carbs in my diet or whatever. So that's what I figured out is the kind of the best diet for me. And as a child, I was always on a blood sugar. So I had oatmeal for breakfast every morning. And then I'd be hungry two hours later. And I never, even into adulthood, I never understood why. I couldn't go for more than two hours without eating at school. I always kind of felt like I was like, ooh, you know. Um, so if you have a teenage girl, especially who is struggling, kind of like can't go more than a few hours without eating, like they, you know, I was always getting tested for low blood sugar, never saw anything because they're testing me just fasting, which was fine. Um, and because what I found is like, if I fast in the morning, I can, I feel fine. My blood sugar is fine. Actually, my blood sugar stays pretty high. Like I wake up, it's around 90 ish. Um, it stays like that. Even if I fast for more than 14 hours, it's still pretty, you know, it doesn't really go down much. And I don't feel like I have to eat, but if I eat one of those starchy carbs, the blood sugar spikes. And then I would go back down to like 70. And that's when I would feel kind of shaky. So I think that I just have rebound hypoglycemia. Um, even now that I am much healthier than I was in my teens and early twenties, I still kind of saw some of that rebound effect, although my body deals with it better. So I, I think that was the biggest takeaway for me is that I just do better on a low glycemic diet, um, so even though I do teenager, high intensity exercise. So if you have a teenager that is frustrated with weight, cause we do see a lot of that in our office, like why, you know, now that she's 16 years old, has she put on a little bit more weight or she can't reverse it. 
And it's hard because the teenager says, well, you know, I eat better than my friend. It doesn't matter. The monitor is going to show you where she spikes. And in that case, when she's spiking and the insulin is elevating, it's going to put the food preferentially into the, or the sugar preferentially into the fat. It just goes in easier. So understanding even the big bad guys, I think can be a big help because we, we don't want to say that it's way you can't eat this, you can't, but at least if they see, okay, here's where you're spiking, kind of like we do food sensitivities, when you got a bad gut, okay, these are the three dudes that you just got to stay away from. So it, it just may help you control some of those roller coasters. I think that leads into also when you talked about exercise, I am a distance runner, I love distance running, but my genetics meets my distance running creates higher fasting sugars. I lived fasting sugars when I woke up in the morning about a hundred, a little over a hundred. So, so, and, and what I found is the days that I didn't exercise the one day Friday, which is my day before my long run, my numbers ran lower. So again, a situation where you are frustrated, struggling with your teenage or your college student what their exercise is. Maybe they need to do a little more CrossFit lift and they need to get away from all the cardio or maybe they need to do a little bit more yoga to build strength and then stay away from the spiking sugar. So I think it can give you a really good direction and then put together a meal plan that they can follow, that they can understand that's going to keep that roller coaster down and hopefully the insulin down. Well, and I think it's respecting bio-individuality, right? Because right. not my friends didn't necessarily um, have that kind of experience right. with I found with my patients that some of them are not getting these spikes with potatoes and things like that. Um, everyone seems to be really different. Now, the interesting thing about exercise is that I didn't really see a huge elevation with exercise in the afternoon because I had eaten lunch. And a lot of times I'll have a snack of like fruit before I go work out. I work out at 430 in the afternoon. And so post-workout, I would see a blood sugar of about 150. I mean, really not sometimes only 140. It really wasn't terrible. Um, and then it would come back down to baseline pretty quickly, but I wouldn't feel, it takes me a while to get hungry after those extra, you know, after that exercise session. However, on Saturday mornings, I usually go and work out at nine in the morning and I don't eat before. So it's been a pretty long fast for me by the time I get there. And Saturday morning workouts are usually a lot more high cardio based. Um, they're partner workouts. And so you're kind of pushing yourself harder anyway. So uh, the workout I did on the Saturday before I left, right before I took my monitor off, um, I was completely fasted. I had been fasting for like 16 hours. When I started the workout, I didn't feel hungry. I felt fine. I felt, you know, I had a lot of water and stuff, but we ran outside and it was pretty hot and we did a lot of like wall balls. So it was a lot of high, high heart rate stuff. My blood sugar right when I was done was 176. And then I waited a little bit, maybe 10 minutes and took it again. It was 196. <laughs> so that was really interesting to me. And I had, there was another girl in my CrossFit gym who had done a continuous glucose monitor too. And she said that she had noticed the same thing when she did fasted workouts. And all I think is that the body was like there, I've run out of storage and I've got to pour more sugar back into the blood Absolutely. to power this. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it was just really interesting. And then, but even and that kind of explains why I post that workout. It takes me about an hour to get hungry because my blood sugar is still pretty high. And so um, it was just kind of cool to see that and kind of respect that my body had performed in that way with no food. I felt like I could push it pretty hard. Now, that doesn't, you know, I've seen some of the research and Mark, Mike Mutzel does a really good job of this talking about how fasted workouts don't necessarily increase fat burning, um, but it did empty out my glucose storage. So I think that's what happened was like all that glycogen just got poured back into the blood and then it got powered into the muscles as needed, which is what's supposed to happen. So um, I don't think there's a right or a wrong way for that. Um, I just thought that was an interesting observation. The other thing that I've noticed, so I, I've had all my patients say that stress elevates their blood sugar. It didn't with me. So the week that I had it on, you know, we had a really stressful week at work because um, we just had a family emergency with one of our staff. And so we were short staffed and that was probably one of the most stressful weeks I've ever had at work. And my blood sugar didn't go up at all in regards to, and I thought it would. Now I've had several patients tell me that they've seen major blood sugar elevations with stress. For some reason, my body does not seem to respond that way. And so I think that's just an individual kind of observation that 
I, I have had some patients tell me that has been their biggest elevation up to the 140s just with stress in between meals, all of that. Now, could the food they're eating also be affecting how they're dealing with stress? Definitely. So we're going to dive into that more on an individual level in our individual consults. But I just thought that was interesting. And then I had one patient who got COVID while she had it on and saw a major elevation. She did not eat. She didn't really feel like eating. And her blood sugar would go up to like the 140s um, throughout the day. And I think it's just the body's like, we got to power the immune system. So we're going to yep. pour more sugar back into the blood to do that. And then she said, once she got over it, the blood sugar went back down to normal. So I thought that was a really cool observation too. So I think the take home from all of this, it, it, and even going back to your exercise, is that understanding how to be metabolically flexible, how to optimize that is, is really what, what probably the big take home of, of, of the monitor and the exercise and all of that is, right? You want an exercise that is optimal for you that's going to burn glucose aggressively in exercise, right? Because you're, you work out, your insulin drops, the body dumps glucose in, and then what's gonna happen is you're going to recover healthy. So that's where you, you can look at that number, like, like I experimented and I found not a lot of bumps in my blood sugar with my long run for, you know, for 10, 12 miles, but I did when I did my intervals, find it elevated, kind of like what Sheila was talking about. So, so where I think this all becomes important is maybe you're somebody who says, hey, I'm doing this class at my workout or I'm running five miles a day and I'm not losing weight and I don't feel as good. If you're not noticing that bump when you're exercising, then you need to change your workout. So it's, it's micromanagement, right? Then what will happen is you go, hey, I got to do more intervals till I see that bump up. And then you look at what you're eating and you realize what's spiking. And I think when you combine all of that together, some people may do well fasted. Mike Mutzel says also it was a great study. I heard what Sheila was talking about. He said, but if you can't exercise because you're fatigued, you're not doing yourself any good. So then you better fuel it. So, so right. for me, I need to do a little goo in the middle to keep going. So that helps me push the pressure of how hard I'm exercising. And then that enables my sugar to bump up. So, so I think the, the take home of this is it's not always, oh, my hormones are out. And it's, it's not always, you know, what ex, what that I'm exercising, not exercising. It's, it's so bio-individualized. And when you put the stable sugar with the right exercise for you, plus minus, should you fast working out with what's your sugar doing while you're sleeping? Is it bottoming out? Is it spiking up? I think all of that together creates an optimal thing for you. If you look and you spike with stress, then you've got to work on that. I mean, that's the lifestyle change. So I, I think it's a really good educational tool. Mm -hmm. I don't I'm think sure. we saw massive differences that I'm menopausal and you're not. I, I think that that was one of the other things we wanted to experiment. Is it I would be say bad? your your glucose was on average a little bit higher than mine. But like you said, it was mostly on days of exercise. But like, I think you you were saying your baseline went down to like one. 10 or something. My baseline lived about 105, 103 when I would wake up in the morning and, and, and it was more sensitive. There were times I would wake up, it was a hundred or a little over a hundred. And then right before I'd go to work out as my body would get revved up, it would bump to 120. But I, I run high octane. I mean, I, I think that's my nutty personality. Yeah. That's probably difference in personality more than anything. In the, the menopausal concept. That's what's interesting. Cause I am a stress person, but I express it. Like I don't, I'm just in. So, so I think I that am. helps me actually that I, I don't bottle it in or whatever. I just let it out. But I, I think the biggest thing has been, I liked the instant feedback and I, yeah. and, and the significance was, okay, I know as a nutrition professional, if my blood sugar goes up post meal, insulin has to deal with that, which means it's going to store in the liver, in the muscle, in the fat. I don't need at this age, a ton of storage. And so I saw, you know, in real time, and we're not just talking about weight here. I know that for my blood vessels, when you've got all that sugar in the bloodstream, you're aging faster. So mm -hmm. instant feedback for me was like, I don't want to eat white rice a lot because I don't need that much sugar in my bloodstream a lot. That long-term could do a lot of damage. And so I can see that in real time. And that was more motivating me than this, than the scale, honestly, like that I want to age well and not be in a diaper or a wheelchair. <laughs> so 
knowing which foods were making my blood sugar go out of control, which would make me age faster is a really good motivational factor to me be like, those foods are not worth it for me a lot. Like, yes, I'm going to still eat white rice sometimes. And no, I'm not going to cool it and then eat it because that's too much work for me. So I'm just going to avoid it because I don't like it all that much anyway. So I think that's kind of how I'm going to also approach it with a lot of patients. And that's kind of what you can get from this. Like how, because I've had a lot of people go, well, why am I looking at this and what does it mean? And so that's where us diving into it personally can be helpful because I can explain what it means for you. These are just general videos of us saying, here's the patterns we've seen, but I need to really kind of analyze what your gut look like. How old are you? What is your, you know, sleep patterns like? What and medications what's your are you complaint, on? Right? What is your issue? You yeah. Know what Dale are you looking for? The big Alzheimer's guy says three reasons for Alzheimer's, right? Inflammation, low hormones, and blood sugar. You put blood sugar in the brain, you get a lot of free radicals. And then those free radicals blow your brain up, gives you brain atrophy. So it adds right back to what you said about aging, that you don't think about it sometimes in your... 30s and 40s. And even in your 50s, you don't think about it as much or where you get into your 60s and you're still pretty healthy. But that dysregulation, again, you're right. It's not just the weight, but it's what else is going on underneath the hood. But too much blood sugar in your brain, that's a the path to Alzheimer's also. So yes, yeah. it's really about longevity. And when you look at it that way, you start to take a step back and it's not deprivation. We use this example all the time. When you go shopping, when you go to the mall, you look around at what your budget is, and then you make the decision of what pocketbook you're going to buy or what pair of pants you're going to buy. Or if you're booking a vacation, you look at what you can do. And, and, and I think it's everybody it would be really nice to say, oh, I can travel wherever I want, whenever I want, but that's not a reality. And I think we've got to look at food that way. And we don't want to use the word diet. There's a, it's not diet, anti-diet. I don't want to go there. It's about long-term health. It's, it's being responsible for your personal health. Even though you've got a million things going on, you just don't want to wake up, like Sheila said, you know, muscle weak and not fit and not healthy. And you don't want that brain poor diagnosis that has been building for the last 10 years. So understanding what you need to do to maximize your health, get your hormones where they need to be, get the estriol, estradiol, the combination bioidentical hormone in there as you're aging, deal with estrogen dominance, maybe in your forties, look at lower progesterone or changes in your thirties and, and maximize your gut and your blood sugar, and then see what the hormones do. And that's going to take you well, healthy into your eighties and nineties. Yep. So this has been a fun experiment. Um, hope you guys have enjoyed this series. And we'll be back next week with another video on a new and exciting topic. <laughs> yeah, we're happy to order your monitor. Have a good That's one. Great.